Good evening, everyone. Howdy, howdy. Let's stand up together. So good to be together. It's been a long time since we had a Sunday night service. And it's been a, a while since we have some folks that are with us that I just want to point them out to you and let's welcome them. Manuel and Brandy Viscar from Mexico. They are with us tonight. So good to see you. Good to see both of you. They pastor our sister church, or let's say our daughter church down in, in Mexico, Rosarito, off of, right around that area. And they said they had a great service down there. And uh, we're so glad to have them. And then our very special guests, Dick and Donna Williams. Let's welcome them. We're so glad that they could be with us. We're so thankful that they could be with us. But you know the Holy Spirit's here. You feel his presence here already. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we just bring our praise. We bring our worship, Lord, to you tonight. We thank you, God, that you've made a way for Dick and Donna to be with us, and with us and Manuel and Brandy. And Lord, uh, we're just so grateful that we could be together tonight, that this is your time. Holy Spirit, this is your time tonight. And so, Lord, we just bless you and praise you. We invite you to come and fill us to overflowing. Lord, we just believe that every person here and those that are not here tonight, there's going to be an impartation of tremendous grace and mercy and encouragement. So, Lord, we just pray. Come, Holy Spirit, now. Come, Holy Spirit, now. We bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Let's praise him. We serve a good God, amen? Hallelujah. Let's praise him tonight. Oh, yes, Lord. Lift you up today, Lord. Magnify you, God. Exalt you. You are worthy, Lord. He became sin who knew no sin we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing jesus messiah of old days, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Jesus 
like the name of Jesus. I mean, you can just say that name and it just it just ignites something inside of you. It just it just fills you with such joy and peace and and awe. And you know, when we call upon the name of the Lord, he responds to us. We can be in every situation no matter where we're at, no matter where we're at in the world, we can call upon Jesus and he's right there. Amen. Hallelujah. What a blessing. <laughs> what a blessing. Hallelujah. Let's continue to worship him. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Oh, hallelujah. Lift you up, Jesus. King of kings, 
majesty, God of heaven, living in me, gentle Savior, closest friend, strong deliverer, beginning and end, all within me falls at your throne.
let's sing that chorus again. Your majesty, I can't look out. I lay my all before you now. In royal robes, I don't deserve. I live to serve your majesty. to our King, to our King and Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name. Exalt you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we serve your majesty. We bow before your majesty. Oh, God, we thank you and praise you tonight. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You're worthy of all praise. We serve a good God. Amen. Our God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, the scriptures tell us. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, it's been a long time since Dick and Donna were with us, and it's just so good to see you. God has kept you, hand upon you. And you and was it cold up there before you when you left? Kind of testy, but not bad. This is probably like summer down here then. Well, we had snow on the ground for several days. Yeah. Which is unusual for Boise. We're kind of in a banana belt. Some of the rest of the state has some pretty adverse winters, but uh, it's been a basically mild winter yeah. up our way, Jim. Well, we I know you'd probably like some more snow. We'd love to have rain. We have less than two inches of rain. We're we need we need oh some my. rain down here, so pray for rain. That is the season for rain. Amen. Yes. Well, listen. We want to bring our blessing, our love offering. We've been talking about, and hope that you prepared to bring it. So, uh, if you're writing a check, of course you make it out to Elsinore Christian Center, and we will make sure that all of this goes to our brother and our sister tonight. Elsinore Christian Center. Jim, if you like, you can do that at the end when I'm through. Usually. That's fine, sure. Why don't sure. we do it that way? And I'll yeah. just jump right in. The worship was so sweet, you know, to just jump into the flow of that. And uh, we're just so glad to be here. Tell them about your tapes over here. Okay, and I'll, I'll just mention, because sometimes I forget to mention, there's CDs over there, and there's change in an envelope. They're $10 each, and just serve yourself if you're so inclined. You know, 2020 has been... Without saying, but I'll just say it. Most unusual year. A friend of ours, who now lives in Texas, said that if 2020 were a beverage, it would have been what they have you drink in before a colonoscopy. <laughs> it's kind of a make straight the way and a preparation that sort of widens and deepens our channel to drink more deeply of the artesian well of Jesus within us that would flow out from us, our attitude and action, our gaze, our countenance, streams of living water. That is the very Zoe life of God. So we'll move along in word and song this evening, and there'll be a punctuated pause on occasion for a personal prophetic word to encourage, that is to edify, to build up, is to edify, to exhort, that's to stir up, 
and to console or to comfort. That's to soothe us where we've been roughed up by disappointment and the attack of the enemy and sometime our own religious self-flagellation and we just need to recognize the embrace of his grace that he loves us as is with the ability to transform us progressively and who we want to be more and more like in attitude and action Jesus Christ. We're already like him in his image and our spirit that's been born again. We have been imputed with righteousness based on his perfect performance on our behalf. And we embrace the grace of that righteousness and something wonderful happens. The empowering grace to live righteous rises up within us and we learn to live according to his promptings and move in the buoyancy, force, and flow of his life. In the same way we receive him, his grace, which is the force of his favor that has been released through the finished work of cross that saves us, that rescues us from a, an appointment with eternal darkness that's been canceled. We are now with a heavenly destiny and we learn that that grace has provided everything we could ever need and that grace begins to give us a revelatory education on who we are in Christ and what we have in him and we learn to appropriate that on a daily basis. As you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. I know that in the early moments of my salvation I thought, oh this feels wonderful, there's a revolution that's gone on inside and I felt it was somehow up to me to walk it out and live it out by sheer force of willpower and willpower didn't take me very far. I was reduced to rely on Him whose grace is available moment by moment. Grace, not an excuse for sin, it's the remedy for sin. It cancels sin's penalty. And as we rely on Him moment by moment, it crosses out the flesh and cancels sin's power. But that's something that we learn the rest of our natural life now. I'm still a work in progress. Don't have a spiritual PhD in a thing I just said, but I'm further along than the last time I saw you. Hallelujah. This last year was commemorative for Donna and I. We celebrated 30 years of full-time itinerant ministry, starting in 1990, and we'd done it in snatches prior to that, but were primarily pastoral before 1990 for about 20 years three different places. We celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary in July. That was the 25th. And I celebrated my 80th birthday in September, became an octogenarian. 20 years ago, you'd have said octogenarian, and I would have thought that was some obscure denomination. It's been a good year for us. We're anticipatory even as we enter into 2021 that God has some marvelous surprises to release, some sovereign, sensitive, strong, mighty, majestic responses to the prayers that have gone up in way of intercession for the church and from the church and for our nation. Hallelujah. Just kind of reminiscing my anointed recall one day I wrote this song looking in my rearview mirror down the road I've been thinking on his faithfulness time and again the storms that blew he saw me through when it felt like I would die when feelings raged he calmed the waves In gratefulness I cry Pure faith, simple faith Resting in His righteous ways Leaning on His pure and powerful words Pure faith, holy faith Embraced by arms of grace Wrapping my heart around the good things That I've heard 
Down the pike of life I traveled Sometimes storm clouds form I can look ahead In the light What he said When storm winds blow His inner glow Keeps me safe and warm In the night watch He's the fortress Camped around my bed Pure faith Simple faith Resting in his Righteous ways Leaning on his Pure and powerful words Pure faith Holy faith Embraced by arms of grace Wrapping my heart around the good things that I've heard Wrapping my heart around the good things that I've heard You know folks, over the years I've written probably well over 200 songs. I've written more songs than I remember. That's one reason I put them on CDs, to be able to rehearse them and recall them again. And it's interesting the climate of inspiration in which a song is birthed. The Lord gives us a certain seed, a creative seed, if you would. Nashville songwriters call it a hook line. And you have a phrase or a message and you begin to camp around it. And you begin to collaborate with the Supreme Creative One, the Holy Spirit, with the gift that He's placed within you. And a song begins to be birthed. And that seed begins to take shape in the form of lyrics, melody, a couple of verses, a bridge, and yet a, another melody, and a verse. The next thing you know, you have something that thematically conveys in creative packaging something of the Lord's goodness and greatness that encouraged you at the time and you have a sense that it'll encourage others too. You know, we've traveled primarily the western half of the lower 48, as Alaska calls us, over the last 30 years. Prior to that, uh, with Youth with a Mission, we'd probably been in seven or eight different countries over the years. But I can recall in the earlier phases of this ministry, back in the uh, early 90s, I had a ministry tour, and the first several years I did this without Donna. She's at home responsibilities, and one of our boys was still in school. And I don't know how in the world I did it. It was just amazing grace. Grace is the operational power of God's favor that does in us and through us and for us what we could never do in and of ourselves. And we begin to connect with grace as we come to the end of our self-sourced independence and as we learn to recognize that as a dead end and trust in the operational power of his favor in us, we live in the climate of grace. It's revelatory. It reveals things that our natural mind could never see. It's empowering. It's providential. It provides for us from the hand of God's generosity. And what can I say? It is truly amazing. Once again, it's not an excuse for sin. That's when at a level of mental ascent and intellectual ascent, it, it, it becomes license. But as we get that revelation of God's grace in our heart, we recognize that we are weak in and of ourselves, and it becomes a stage for God to demonstrate his power and to cause us to live in a flow of liberation and to become empowered liberators on behalf of others. Hallelujah. But uh, we had a, a, it was a trip to big sky country, Montana. And it was the first part of November. And winter began to hit a little earlier than usual. Uh, I was driving up out of Idaho. 
and into Montana over what they called the Monida Pass. And there was a storm that came just perpendicular across the freeway at that time. And it was thick, and it was blowing, and it was near zero visibility. And you know, folks, one of the things about adversity, it is a poignant reminder to rely on him within us who is all-powerful. And that includes traveling mercies. We've seen him move storms over when we prayed and taken dominion in the midst and over the weather. That's what Jesus did, and we do the works that he did. And we've seen hailstorms that were zero visibility, that we were slipping and sliding on the road and managed to get over to the shoulder and joined our voices together and commanded the hail to cease, and it did. But there's been grace at times, enduring grace, to go through storms. And this was one of those times. And I remember it was a white-knuckle ride. And I was getting passed up by semis, and they were throwing more and more of the snow and the sludge and the wind was blowing it and it was going almost uh, horizontal with the road, the fierceness of the wind. And at that time, I was driving a kind of a tinty little Ford Tempo. We started this ministry out on a thrift store shoestring in 1990 and now we're operating on a, on a, a nice long Nike shoestring. <laughs> But it was the beginning of uh, the hunting season in Montana, and Montanans joke that that's the state religion of Montana. And the hunters were out, and motel rooms were really scarce, and they were going to be inside for the fierceness of this thing before they were going tromping around in the hills again looking for game. And we don't belittle that. Some of our best friends are hunters, and we have a lot of their bounty stored up in our freezer, everything from antelope to, <clears throat> to venison to um, uh, elk uh, and moose. I remember we invited uh, friends over and Donna decided to get adventurous and made moose stew and she got Sarah Palin's recipe from off of the uh, internet. And moose is really good, you know, it's kind of sweet and lean and uh, it's not at all gamey and um, we appreciate the work of their hands. but. I was at that time praying for a motel anywhere and then praying that there would be a room open and I was released and reduced to rely on him and I was um, speaking in tongues a mile a minute and shouting the name of Jesus and declaring the sovereignty and supremacy of him who walks upon the water and I had gotten over the summit and still had a lot of storm to face and still a lot of descent before I would go down into the valley. And right there in Dillon, Montana, it's the first sign of civilization you see in that kind of situation. I pulled off on the off-ramp, and lo and behold, there was a motel, a sundowner motel, and they had one room left, and it happened to be on the lower floor. And I remember uh, unpacking my stuff and loading it in, and getting into my comfy sweats and just falling back into bed from sheer exhaustion and just grateful to God for his preserving grace from coming over the Monida summit and downward and knowing that there would be grace for tomorrow. And I awakened after eight hours of sanctified slumber. I went under like a submarine with screen doors, didn't know anything until the sun came shining through that chiffon curtain and it was announcing the sunshine of another day i could hear the trucks uh, breaking up the uh, kind of broken snow floor on the freeway that was just maybe uh, uh, several hundred yards beyond the hotel and thinking hallelujah and i loaded up the car and the next thing you know i was down into the valley below it had been uh, not cold enough to snow there and it was emerald green, the fields were. And it had one of those patented Montana skies with the fluffy cumulus clouds. And it was framing the mountains. And a uh, hundred yards down the road, there were two deer that were running side by side and in perfect sync like Olympic hurdlers. They jumped over a fence and they darted past a dilapidated old cabin. And you know, at this point, my mind was so renewed as we embrace the renewing grace of the Spirit of God within us, 
in our heart and we recognize Jesus and his centrality, there's that flow of spirit life that transfuses our minds and that gets us on course to where we're thinking in soundness, in accord, paralleling the word, uh, our recall, our reason, our recall. We're thinking back on the goodness of God and his preserving intervention so often along the way. We're thinking back also on the forgiveness that we have and those hackles of condemnation that would try to attach themselves from some of our rottenness in our resume and our times past. We recognize that we have forgiveness of those things. We have forgiveness of sins. There's time when we step in some poop in the pasture and need our feet washed, and he does that with the water of life, praise God. But our state of forgiveness, past, present, and future from sin, and we are renewed in our spirit to think, oh, God, thank you that I don't have to be haunted and hammered and hackled by some of those things. And for the life lessons that I retrieved from them, thank you, Lord. And thank you for just your intersecting intervention. We haven't had nary a, a fender bender in two and a half million miles of driving on a series of cars. Oh, wow. And I saw this dilapidated old cabin that the deer ran by. And my mind, my reason, my recall, and our imagination, our ability to envision. I could begin to see something going on inside that cabin. I saw a senior saint rising up out of the rack with, uh, you know, a lot of mileage on his earth suit. His significant other had passed on before him, and he walked with a bit of a creak down the hall, but with his raspy voice was just giving grace and glory to the Lord and looking forward with his appointment with Jesus there in the kitchen area. And the next thing you know, the coffee pot was uh, coming to a boil, and he was ready for a good job of jolt. The word was shining on the scriptures and he was inhaling the breath of the word of God and I could see him strolling over to the window to see those two deer bolting past and taking off into the meadows beyond and could sense the renewal going on and the next thing you know he's just caught up in the rejoicing of the moment. God's presence is permeating the room and he begins to dance you know with his long johns on there. And the next thing you know, he's saying, arthritis, be gone. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he begins to laugh. He begins to cry, just overwhelmed by the goodness of God manifested in his presence. That's the kind of renewal that fills us again with the fuel of his life. And we move in the buoyancy, force, and flow of the spirit life of Jesus the King within us. And we find that we are graced to live in purity and power. And when we veer to the left, which is license, or the right, which is legalism, we find we need to sometime back up and get back to square one and get renewed to our life source and get back on course on this journey of knowing him in ever-increasing intimacy and making him known in heightened effectiveness. That's our journey. That's our mission. And he's the fuel for that down here. But as I was contemplating that, the creative seed, hook line if you would, Nashville-esque, Montana Morning came to mind. This was the song that I wrote. Sometimes it's first a storm and then a song. Another brisk Montana morning, golden glimmer has me blinking. Rising now, I hear me creaking, down the hall I toy. To the place I meet with Jesus, feed the empty stove and arm load. Soon the room is bright with warm glow. Coffee pot is dense to a boil. Divine appointment, his name is just like ointment. Well, he rubs it into my needy soul. I'm worshiping my God on my. That's it. I write them, she knows them. On my fire, the master's breathing, consuming all my fear and grieving. Then her fire is rising as he stokes it with his rod. Out the window there I gaze, 
scan the morning's golden haze. Two deer bolt across the yard. Lord, reduce my My spirit leaps and runs with Jesus through the meadows of his kingdom, brightness of his fragrant freedom, raising on the greatness of his fruits. Divine appointment, his name is just like ointment. Well, he rubs it into my needy soul. I'm worshiping my God. On my fire, the master's breathing. Consuming all my fear and grieving Then her fire is rising As he stokes it with his rod Beside myself with holy joy I'm dancing like a little boy I step in through the room Just gliding in his peace Safety in the arms of his grace Kingdom love has filled the place Laughing in his presence now Laughing yet with sweet tears of release. Divine appointment, his name is just like ointment, rubs it into my needy soul, I'm worshiping my God. On my fire the master's breathing, consuming all my fear and grieving, and her fire is rising as he stokes it with his rod. And her fire is rising as he stokes it with his rod. Some words of personal encouragement here. Glenn, I'm not the first one to have said this. I've heard it from others. But I feel a keen witness in the spirit that we are about to see an invasion of revelatory grace in the LDS community. There's first fruits of that. Our next door neighbors, you mentioned too. You know, they're, they're LDS or Mormon and their connection. And yet there has been a revelation of God's grace and they know him and they love him. Jesus of the scriptures. Jackson, our 15-year-old, has befriended and been befriended by Jerry, our next-door neighbor. And they go for walks on occasion. And Jerry is well into his 60s now. And Jackson, he's just sweet, spirited, and yet with unmitigated gall in the things that he says. He's come into the fullness of the spirit the overflow of speaking in tongues. And he asked Jerry, he said, Jerry, are you a Christian or a Mormon? And Jerry said, well, I'm a Mormon, but I'm more a Christian than a Mormon. In other words, it's just kind of a connection with the culture rather than the cultic aspect of that. And I find I'm able to fellowship with him on a spiritual level. The same thing with one of my hygienists who I've had for years, has kept my teeth from falling out, who says I'll probably keep what I've got left, and that's always nice to hear. But I can fellowship in Holy Ghost Koinonia with Christ in common with Kristen when she's cleaning my teeth. Of course, she does most of the talking because you don't talk too much when you're getting your teeth cleaned. I'll get an insertion every now and then. It gets her started off on another tangent. Glenn, you're going to be instrumental in that. Obviously a man of extreme height in the physical, but you're going to be as a lighthouse, and I may have said this before, that pierces the dark fog of cultic persuasion and begins to shine as a lighthouse and a beacon that beckons them to the safe shore of the embrace, the grace of the Savior of the Scriptures, King Jesus Christ. There'll be occasion and opportunity for it. Your testimony will be translated to transmit the availability of Him. And I'm sure it's happened to some degree already, but will happen in a multiplied manner in this season of visitation to come, is we're going to see quadrants of society in 
invaded every strata, every area of Western civilization, media, the arts, politics, education. We're going to see there begin to be a permeation of the leaven of the kingdom of God and in the heat of the times it begins to swell and become dominant in its statements. A brother here, what is your name? Jody. Jody. Highly contemplative and gentle. You're a thinker. You draw from the depths of God's well. You're not given to the stampede of a herd instinct of conformity. But you're a guy who's out of the box but not out of his mind and has an unusual way of saying things and sometimes it seems to come out of left field but it comes right over home plate. God's cultivated that art of the heart in you and so it'll be. Seated next to Jody is Roger. 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 Roger, did I say that right? Roche. Roche, okay. I said Roger and it was Roche. Rhymes with crochet. Thank you. <laughs> Your blend of soul is of mercy and joy. The ability to be a good listener and intuitively to come up with solutions spoken in healing love. So it's been and so it'll be continually in these days. And there'll be a particular ministry to younger women, millennials. They'll sense that maternal expression of God in you sense your authenticity and anointing and be drawn to that shade. And you'll have opportunity to speak into their lives because what the millennials in mass are looking for is authenticity with anointing. The dimension of the supernatural wrapped in real personhood. When they see that, they are drawn to it like a magnet. was the late 80s, and we were going through a tremendous trial. We were just being tested right up to our earlobes, and there seemed to be just circumstantial lack everywhere we looked. And God reminded me of David that even in the midst of circumstantial lack being pursued by King Saul with blood in his eye, he could say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. The grace of God has supplied everything we could ever need. And he teaches us by faith to appropriate that and bring it into manifestation in whatever area of need we might be contesting. And he also reminded that David wrote some of his uh, anointed all-time eternal hits in a cave, living from cave to cave. And he beckoned me into our bedroom, had me sit down on a chair that was guitar friendly, that's one without arms, and I thought to myself, you know, I can imagine Dave's cave, and a, the Hebraic uh, chord chemistry was probably the counterpart of our blues, and if you play the guitar, you know, when you're playing around in the key of E, and so I began to think to myself, David probably started off you know, with a lament, singing the blues, but the holy but, but God, who is rich in mercy and all-powerful, is my deliverance, in him will I trust. And there was this climactic confession of God's goodness and greatness, even as he had poured his heart out, beginning with a lament. And so this song began to take place, and as I recognized the heat of trial, the only thing it was burning away was superficiality and baggage. And what it was doing 
was driving and drawing me into a new depth of dependency on him, and he would demonstrate his presence in the midst of the fire, but also begin to cause me to see an avenue to move through it on the other side and come through it with refined faith and hope to a greater degree than before. And as the Holy Spirit and I began to collaborate, this was the song that came forth. Facing my days, surrounded by the blues, I know for certain I'm not going to lose. Sooner or later, Jesus turns it around for me. To get where I'm going, got to walk through some rain. Oh, but I know the sun is going to shine bright again. Sooner or later, He'll turn it around for me, and it's gonna be soon. Here in the furnace, it's burning my bonds away. And it's forming in my soul, turning into gold, brighter and purer day by day. I hear his word and my faith rises high, got the aerial view. I see deep and wide, sooner or later, he turns it around for me. Mm -hmm. Here in the furnace, it's burning my minds away. Kind of like yodeling. And it's forming in my soul, turning into gold, brighter and purer day by day. This chapter will end, but not the book. Soon I know I'm going to take a blessed backward look as I sweetly remember how he turned it around for me. Sweetly remember how he turned it around for me. Hallelujah, and he did. Ah, praise the Lord. A brother right here, we're making eye contact. You've got the stocking cap on there, which is can be standard equipment for up our end. Yeah. And I I just got a tip off on your name, it's Johnny. Hallelujah. Johnny turning a corner, coming into a new beginning. The sword of the Lord has just hit the hackles on your heels of things that tried to cling and bring you down. But there's a persevering, no quit attitude in the depths of you that your heavenly father just loves and is proud of you. Shows snapshots in the throne room of you or the counterpart of what daddy Lord would do as the angels encircle him and wreath his glory. And the best is yet to come. Those things that were devastating, train wreck proportions uh, relationally, and habits that were formed, the Lord just loved you in and through the midst of that and has brought you into a place to where you are going to have a ministry of encouragement. It's going to be a ministry of evangelism. It's going to meet people in the valley of the shadow and say, been there, did that. The Lord was there with me and he brought me to here. There's an integrity and an authenticity about you that the Lord loves. It's a soft-spoken humility and breakthrough under breakthrough that's already happened. And there'll be more of the same. And you'll give glory to Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God bless you, Johnny. I was back in Big Sky Country, and I was doing a um, series of meetings from Sunday to Sunday and everything in between. And this particular tour started in Whitefish, which is about, oh, 26 miles south of the Canadian border. And Montanans, they joke about the weather. They say, if you don't like it now, wait for half an hour and it'll change. 
And, and there's something to it. This was the spring of the year. It was in uh, early May, and it was a kind of a camp out. Folks had brought their RVs and tents and the like, and I was administered that evening and was supposed to minister as there was a, a, a structure of bleachers for folks to sit on, and there was a lake behind me, and I was looking forward to it. But we woke up to one of those premature last gasp of winter, and it was a cold rain mixed with sleet, and I knew I wasn't going to be doing much of anything publicly, standing out in the open, but Montanans are a rough group. They're a hearty bunch of, of a community, and uh, they went to their, got tarps out of their car, and where three or more trees were gathered together, they covered it with a tarp. <laughs> And there was this little cluster of kind of like clusters in a vineyard that were all over the place. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I'm going to sprint when I get a little let up in the rain from the tarp I'm standing over and just kind of eavesdrop on what's going on. And they were sharing testimonies. Some of them had emerged from the disappointment, the devastation of bankruptcy. Some of them uh, with divorce and they found they didn't have to have a D tattooed on their forehead and were relinquished to the garbage pile, and they had been either blessed the second time around with remarriage, but were anticipating putting the Lord first and trusting him to finish the equation as need be and want to be. Many that had been healed, a couple of them had been diagnosed with terminal, terminal diseases and had called upon the name of the Lord and the finished work of the cross by his work, by his stripes we were healed and had seen just a reversal of that cursedness. And others that had lost mates uh, had known the comfort of the Lord in the valley of grief where their significant other had passed on before them. But in every situation, there was this, this little community in a cluster like grapes on a vine celebrating the new wine of the joy of God's spirit. I was so ministered to by it. And on the way home with Pastor Al Baroni, uh, we were going to be ministering in his church indoors on the following Sunday, I had a vision. And I saw roses with broken stems and disheveled scattered petals that were all over the icy ground that were being hit with the same sleet and rain that I had seen earlier. And I saw the nail-pierced hand of Jesus hover over it and begin to gather it up and heal the stems. It was like just divine splints were placed around them. And he began to take the petals and put them on the rose. And each rose was a different color. Some of them were hybrids in a mix of color. And just the configuration of the petals, each is unique. And he spoke to the shattered glass of a vase that they'd been in and just his speech by which all things consist. He who creatively spoke the natural universe into being, speaking from the substance of the spiritual, which is far more real. And that vase began to take shape, and there were these roses arrayed in this marvelous arrangement and emitting fragrance and beauty, and him holding them forth in his nail-pierced hand to that region of western Montana saying, here's life, here's life, take it in and come to where life is and to make a statement of the community of the king, which is not a tight circle, but a horseshoe that invites others into it. We're going to see more and more people that hunger for a sense of family, that hunger for a sense of true fellowship, that hunger to a place to where there is an exchange of healing love on a regular basis. The closest substitute, superficial though it may be, is the neighborhood bar. God's got a much better idea. Yeah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> on the way home, I heard this phrase, once again a creative seed, scattered roses in the rain, and wrote this song. You know, God's in the business of restoring us where we've been broken and shattered. And some of us know what it is to take a proverbial Humpty Dumpty's fall from off the wall and be shattered to smithereens. And the Lord 
gathers us up and puts us back together stronger than ever with Holy Ghost Super Glue. Scattered roses in the rain Long lost joys from seasons past You've gathered them again For a bouquet that will last The fragrance of your love Breathes new life into my soul Made a living sweet bouquet Roses left out in the cold The wreckage I surveyed Was my life after the storm Scattered rubble in the night Twisted, battered without form Those I once called friends Left my silent soul for dead There was nothing they could do Only words of sorrow said Scattered roses in the rain Long lost joys from seasons past You've gathered them again For a bouquet that will Fragrance of your love Breathes new life into my soul Made a living sweet bouquet From roses left out in the cold I long to walk where your fullness dwells Drinking the power from the depths of your well Just keep me free for your glory to tell Walking in our first love Make me the man you want me to be Knowing new wonders your glory to see As you keep me this child so adoring to be Walking in our first love Lord Jesus, each time I call on your name, let nothing in me your glory restrain, trusting in you your own will to gain. Whether it's whirlwind or soft, summer rain, and when the sunrise graces each dawn, let all of yesterday's chapter be gone. All of its glories and all of its wrongs Leaving today and you Leaving today and you Right here, what are your names? Dorothy and Jim. A healing, comforting voice to one another. And a couple who harbors the divine presence in their household, which overflows with welcoming hospitality. Also a dynamic duo of intercession, praying for loved ones. Seem, would seem to be in the fog of the North 40 of God knows where, but he knows where. And his arm is not short that he can't reach with deliverance. And to know you're part of a praying cadre of parents and grandparents. And we're going to see a parade of prodigals emerging from the fog in these days, at first seemingly blinded by the glare of daylight. But the prayer warriors among which you'll be will race across the meadow to embrace them with patriarchal and maternal love, welcoming them back 
as God even now begins to soften the soil of their hearts to receive the seed of the gospel of his love. I bless you, Jim and Dorothy. Brother, standing back in the doorway with the warm little bundle there in your left arm, what's your first name? Andy? Andy? A life coach, an exhorter. You're kind of the holler guy on the team, the most inspirational player, and when your team is down by a couple of scores, able to say, guys, let's remember the playbook. And let's remember the words of our coach that says, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the wor world. And then you rush out of the locker room at halftime and back out onto that field. Where are those Philistines? Hallelujah. An encouraging exhorter of the army of the Lord. A commissioned officer and leader in his army. God bless that to you, Andy. Over here was this, Tim, what's your first name? Mike. Mike, a servant's heart. You're there with a helping hand on a practical level and yet with spiritual sensitivity with anybody in need, but there is this contagious, wonderfully outrageous enthusiasm about you. It overflows and lifts up a standard and causes the troops to rally around it. And it's a contagious impartation of the joy of the Lord, which is your strength imparted to them and becomes their strength. God bless that to you, Mike. It's a wonderful gift. And joy is a kingdom commodity. The very joy of the Lord, it goes beyond speech, but it's still expressed and permeated in your attitude and action of servanthood. Be commended. A special way with the younger generation. Hallelujah. What is your name here? Everly. E Everly? Okay. Probably uh, comes from Ever Loving. <laughs> Very shy right now, but a live wire normally. Multiple gifts, dramatic, musical, dance, things that the Lord will use in her generation and ongoingly as she comes into the maturing of her giftings and personhood. But there's a blend of sweetness and strength and a supernatural gift of faith transfusion. You know, there's the fruit of faith, but there will be times when there is this rising up of supernatural faith to believe for miracles. Hallelujah. So much of it a product of your prayer. You know, it's so important that in quality time with the Lord, we have the eyes of our heart open to see between the lines of the natural and beyond its parameters. Because circumstantially, things are a chaotic mess. The enemy's got his strategies, covert, that are beginning to become more overt. He wants to stir up and engender a spirit of anarchy, sometimes financed by demon-possessed affluency in the natural and sometimes just rising up because people need a cause more than a cause needs people and they immerse it in self-righteousness with a certain crusader kind of attitude but in reality it is destructive and it's a spirit of lawlessness and anarchy that which would try to prompt the necessity of martial law and the annihilation of the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, not recognizing the necessity of moral absolutes for a culture to work. When society says there are no absolutes, society becomes the absolute 
and demands conformity in order for there to be survival. That's the enemy strategy, but God is countering that. He's been collecting and connecting with the prayers of intercession that continue to crescendo and come up from his people with an intensity and an agony and yet a travail of expectancy that the Lord is getting ready to birth into manifestation a mighty move that will even go beyond the scope of the Welsh revival to completely transform that nation in 1904 in the spark that jumped to Azusa Street and ignited the preaching of Brother William Seymour and the intercessions of Frank Bartleman that began to be a marvelous contagion of the glory of God that engulfed this nation. We've had nuances in the form of the charismatic movements and things out of Toronto, Pensacola, and other places. But we're getting ready to see a certain consummation of visitation, of manifestation that becomes a habitation of God on our planet. And yes, it'll coexist with darkness, but the light will supersede it and show it for what it is. And there will be those with gnashing of teeth that will retreat further into the darkness. But there will be those that it has imprisoned that will see the light and begin to come from it and emerge from it. He begins to train us to reign, to walk in the light of who he is and who we are by virtue of his grace, sons and daughters, royalty. And we begin to walk and to see our needs of intimacy and identity and authority and dominion. We grow up into our inheritance, our joint inheritance we have with the Lord. There's going to be an accelerated growth. There's going to begin to be a spark among millennials and uh, Y generation, Gen Xers, and even some of us that are older than millennials that are war babies is the term they attach to us. I was born in 1940, and I was counting just all the presidents I can remember starting with sitting around the living room listening to FDR saying we have nothing to fear but fear itself, and, and the succession of just historical events and trends of the time and how our values have in large part degenerated, but there's always been a remnant of preservation and declaration of the greatness and goodness of God, and that's going to begin to gather and to be a standard raised higher and brighter than ever before. It's so important we learn to see between the lines and beyond its parameters, otherwise we will vacillate between fear and anger that will eat us alive from within. And God has much better things in store for us. I had a vision, even that underscored and italicized this revelation of God's pending revival and reformation that's going to invade every strata of society. I was coming out of Walmart. It was about a month ago. And I saw a theater, and it wasn't a movie theater, but a theater that pre uh, presented live dramatic plays. And as I looked in, it was pretty well full, but there was tremendous violence and vitriol that was going on among the people in the audience, and it had become escalating egos into fisticuffs, and there were others that were cowering in their seats and trying to cover their face and slouch down. There were others yet, though, that were interceding, and you could sense a certain agony, but a certain expectation and birth pangs of something that was going to be birthed forth into reality. The curtain had yet not arisen on the production, but you could sense uh, the crew putting props into place if you listened carefully. And you could sense a wind beginning to blow, and the curtains, they rippled and began to blow out at an angle from across in front of the stage. The next thing I knew, the curtain rose and there was this production of players that had been a vanguard, some that had been fashioned from cave to cave, kind of a David company, if you would, that were just engulfed in a spirit of worship that began to just fill that room. And they began to sing, there was choreographed dance, there was drama, it was wonderfully creative and innovative, and many of those that 
had been cowering, now were awakened to the fact that there were angels with their arm around their shoulder that were protecting them. The vitriol, some of it began to subside, but a lot of it didn't. And some began to repent and turn and look to the Lord. And emanating from the light of the stage, there were lightning bolts. And those that had presented themselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice, as they were hit by that, they were charged with power to believe for the miraculous. There were others that had been exposed as covert darkness deeper than any deep state that had been exposed for what it was. It was like a, a slimy uh, mass of snakes, and you could sense the lightning just cutting into it and beginning to slice the snakes asunder. There were those that stood up as arrogant humans beating their chest, saying, I will be like the Most High, who had the lust for power and were in positions of power as this world saw it, but were struck down by the lightning and struck down from their place of presumed supremacy. And in the end, the caste came down and began to mingle with the audience, many of which were now one with them. They poured out into the streets, and there were legions of angels that met them, and they could see with the eyes of Elisha and his servant Gehazi more than be for us than against us. They began to see signs and wonders, games and sports events that were going on. There were beginning to be huge areas of the horseshoe or bowls that they were playing in. It became praise and worship situations that were broadcast in the air that they couldn't turn off. And there began to be strategies planned in prayer. There began to be planned flashes in malls of productions and church groups that had left and had a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord that were in a restaurant and had a string of tables joined together. Someone would strike up a chorus and the next thing you know, you had a chorale as David's tabernacle was being exported into the marketplace. There was invasiveness into the world of, of professional sports. And any kneeling that was done was done with God in view. And there was an engendering, a renewed love of country. There began to be a positive revelatory revolution on college campuses that said we're tired of being lied to and being programmed with attempted brainwash and there are pockets going on, even in some Ivy League schools, which have been citadels of humanism. They started out as seminaries back in the day. And returning back to the roots. Hallelujah. We're on the brink of a third great awakening. And that was a sneak preview. And there's others that have seen similar pictures, similar manifestations. Many years ago, an editorialist for Look Magazine wrote the lyrics to this song. Most of the songs I sing are my own, because I learn them easier, more easily. But this one, the lyrics were tattooed on my heart the first time I heard it. And the lyrics by Christopher Wren were sent to music by a gentleman whose full name was John Raymond Cash. And he did a low budget but powerful movie called The Gospel Road. This song appeared into it and Johnny had some dark seasons after that. Some battles with drugs and so on, but June Carter was used as a marvelous vessel of the Lord. And he was renewed and brought back to his first love and in his waning years and concerts, which he gave, this became his signature song. He would say, you know, people ask me for my reason for being and still continuing to do concerts. And he says it's summed up in this song. A patriot who loved his country and yet could see visitation with a prophetic eye. Maybe the man in black will let me jam with him on the other side of glory. He was certainly an 
influenced with some of his earlier records because he was one of the few guys that sang down in a lower register like me. I wish I'd saved some of those old records on the Sun label. They'd be worth a fortune today. I got some by him and by Rick Nelson on Imperial and by Elvis on RCA, Pat Boone on Dot Records. And they're in the archive somewhere. You know, when I moved from home, I didn't realize the value of them. Some of the baseball cards I used to stick in the spokes of my bicycle to make it sound like a motorcycle. Collector's items. <laughs> oh, we live and learn. <laughs> but I'd like to sing this song. Johnny Cash's signature song, his waning years, the handprint that he left. Passion for the Lord, patriotism to see his country restored to its original roots. Jesus was a carpenter, you know he worked with a saw and a hammer, and his hand could form a table true enough to stand forever. And he could have lived his life out in the little town of Nazareth. But he laid aside his tools and he walked the burning highways as he built a house with folks like you and me, living stones. And he found them as they wandered in the wild Judean mountains, called them as they cast their nets on the Sea of Galilee. And for a thousand evenings, as the days behind him ended, he walked among the poor, and he stopped to touch the dying, as he built a house with folks like you and me. Now move again, Lord Jesus, move as a carpenter among us. Men build chapels to their discontent, cathedrals to their sorrow. Many live in golden mansions with the sand for a foundation. And the raging waters rising, Lord, the raging waters rising, yet you build your house on rock once more today and the gates of hell will not prevail against it as the temple, the body, the family, the army, the bride make the kingdom rule of God visible and radiate the glory, the excellence of the excellent one as darkness invades the light. Though the raging water's rising, raging water's rising, you build your house on the rock once more today. Donna and I have still got some tread left on our tires. We want to be a part of that Caleb generation who on into their mid-80s ready to take on the Giants and get a rematch of those guys. When a church committee of 10 voted down Joshua and Caleb the first time. Ah, oh, but Josh and Caleb were tasting grapes by faith and looking forward to the land of milk and honey. And to see an entry God's people transgenerationally entering to possess the land of promise that's already been provided through the finished work of the cross, kingdom life, righteousness, peace, and joy, and the Holy Ghost to drink new depths of that and to bring it forth into a greater dynamic of demonstration than ever before. We got some tread on our tires, so we'll just keep trucking on with Jesus. Along the white line of his word, his freeway is paved with truth and love. 
Finding him so faithful through the valleys and the heights, winding toward our home base up above. Sometimes the valley's deep and dark, he reminds us he's in charge. We look to him and we know just what to do. Sometimes in the awesome heights, we're afraid that we might fall. He said, relax kids, just enjoy the view. Cause we're traveling on the king's own freeway, or singing a new song, freer than any bird, filled and fueled by the power of his spirit. Trucking along the white line of his word. Trucking along the white line of his word. White line of his word. God bless you and God bless America. Hallelujah. Pastor Jim.